Hi, Kamal. Thanks again for coming. I just keep seeing your face and it's always delightful. Thank you. Hey, Kamal. Thanks again for having me. And um, I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about how you got involved in um, with Bryce uh, and with his com company, his startup, and, um, yeah, the music industry. I mean, that's, like, so cool. You're so lucky. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I was t doing some studies over at uh, the Rock Center for Corporate Governance and I fell into blockchain, blockchain technology, and Bitcoin, and I saw a project that was related to uh, to a blockchain dealing with music and had a, a, a token associated with it. So it was an alternative currency dealing with music and on a blockchain. And so I thought, okay, you know what? There's a lot of fraud already in the cryptocurrency space. Um, it brings together two things that I... I really love and am intrigued by, you know, the music business and uh, cryptocurrency. So I thought, why not learn a little bit more? I uh, put some money into it and got to know Bryce and wanted to kind of understand what was really going on in the background. What were the controls that were in place for the uh, crowd sale? And I wanted to know, you know, was everybody getting their tokens the way that they should should be? Was uh, Bryce accessible to the community who had invested or received tokens in the crowd sale? And then just got immersed in the community and we got to meet one night and we talked about our uh, respective backgrounds and um, you know talked a lot about fraud in the music industry. And previously I was working on a project dealing with uh, bribery, bribery and corruption. And uh, we see a parallel in the music industry when it comes to payola. Uh, and, you know, in the course of me being involved in this project, speaking with artists, um, Paola is very much uh, still uh, active and alive. And, I mean, you'd be surprised to hear that it happens here locally, you know, with, with some music uh, organizations and entities here. And just to interrupt you and excuse my ignorance, what does Paola mean? So Paola, I mean, when it first began in, you know, the 50s and the 60s when, when music was, uh, well, music business was really starting to, to build and get much larger and get somewhat corporatized, yeah. um, music businesses would pay, uh, or music organizations or managers would pay radio stations to play songs and play songs uh. so many times a day. So many times an hour, well, usually once an hour, and make sure that songs were continuously being played so they could chart uh, at a certain uh, position. Got it, got it. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it became outlawed, but it the practice still is around. It just huh. it's a little bit different than the way it used to be. Huh. So it's with the radio stations. Yeah, with radio stations, and I mean. As far as I know, I think it may have happened with some other outlets too, but you know, in its inception, that's how it started. And really recently, uh, it's also uh, shown up in, in radio stations as well. I mean, it's, it's stayed present with radio stations. So really, some of those hits that got to the top of the charts years ago may not have if they weren't being paid. Right. So, you know, some of the largest uh, record companies essentially were paying, you know, to make sure that, you know, certain songs were being played so many times a day. And, uh, I mean... It's just bribery, really. Right. That, that is bribery. <laughs> I mean, you see, it, you see it in other areas of, uh, you know, corporate life or corporate activity yeah. and yeah. you know it's just seen as a, a cost of doing business you know so how can we implement blockchain technology and avoid things like payola you know how can we implement blockchain technology and implement or excuse me avoid money laundering or other types of fraud i mean piracy too maybe we can at least combat piracy with blockchain I mean, I don't think it's totally going to eradicate all these problems, but now that we have uh, a system that's verifiable and it's transparent, yeah. um, it, it, I think it'll minimize the ways that these types of fraud schemes occur. And how do you see the blockchain working in the music industry? Would it be with tokens? Well, I think tokens are, are just one example of how it could work. There's um, other examples of how blockchains can be implemented without using a token, token system or it being tied to economics 
whatsoever. So uh, one of the projects that we've worked on with Tau Networks is uh, band name blockchain. And what that does is it sets up a record of bands and band names and band members. So let's say you and I want to start a band and, you know, two years from now, someone else wants to use that same band name that we started. But hey, all we do is look back at the blockchain and say, hey, we have that name first. We may not be as active as you guys are, but, you know, we staked our claim two years ago. So uh, you guys are, have to be version 2.0 or just be a little bit more original. So it's like domain names, really. You get to be a GoDaddy, the blockchain GoDaddy of, of, of uh, band names. Exactly. And so in that instance, there is no token that's associated with our band. However, if our band starts to uh, get popular and we want to try to monetize as an entity, then we say, hey, let's, uh, let's get a token together. Let's see if our fans want to engage with us on really on a peer-to-peer -peer level and help us raise some funds so we can get on the road, maybe do a college tour, or maybe sell some merchandise or sell our own tickets, then that's uh, an, an example of where a token would be a little bit more appropriate. And I know that in the music industry there's always been problems and often uh, litigations over the years of um, songwriters uh, claiming that someone's stolen part of their song. And even with top bands, uh, this has happened. Um, so I gather something like that, the blockchain could also support um, songs as well, music? Well, yeah, definitely. So if, you know, once again, going back to our uh, example, you and I create uh, a piece of music... Mm -hmm. You know, you're the, the singer, the dynamic singer songwriter, and you know, I'm just I'm an engineer, and, and yeah. you know, we have a split of maybe you get 80 percent, I get 20 yeah. percent because I helped record or we helped record the song together, yeah. and that work goes onto the blockchain at a certain time, and a digital signature is assigned to that piece of work. To the music itself. To the music itself, right. and it's stored on the blockchain, right? right? So. We have rights in that piece of data, and if someone wants to say, "Hey, you know what? We really like that. We want to make, a, we want to sample that for a nice uh, little rap song, yeah. and use our hook or use our our, t our tune or our melody, yeah. you know, or you know, you're you're part of the song, yeah. and um, you know, we want to sample it. Okay, well, so they would go to that asset, access that access, and we would essentially allow them. The, the chance to, to use it in their, their piece of music. But I know some people say it can happen ap accidentally, that, um, that mu songwriters and musicians often carry music in their heads and they don't know where they picked it up. And, you know, and I remember when I was young hearing about all these different litigations that were going, oh, you know, this part of that song was just the same as our song. Um, that's going to be hard, really, even on, with the blockchain. But I guess yeah. a bit, a little bit more possible and more transparent because there's never been a, a database like the blockchain that could actually store all the music, right? Right, right. Well, and I think to a, well, I think to a certain extent that that is a, a difficult thing to prove. Oh, who came up with what song first? You know, who, in whose head was it in first? But what you can prove is that it was stored at a yes. certain time first, yeah. and it's almost like a possession thing. You know, yeah. We, yeah. we basically staked our claim, and we said we, we got here first, yeah. so yeah. this is essentially our property yeah. at that point. So, Well, yeah, so things could really, it, at least it could support musicians, and as Bryce was saying, obviously a lot of musicians and artists aren't really business-minded often, and that is a... Uh, they can be taken advantage of, and so hopefully the blockchain will protect and and provide an, a new platform that will make it easier. We also had a, another panel last year um, on the blockchain and um, uh, media, and the startup um, entrepreneurs that came to that were founders of companies that were actually selling media. Um, via the blockchain and again um, they basically said that what this um, opened up t was that individual media producers like Jeremy on the camera sure. could actually sell um, his piece of video um, and no one really else could like use it unless they bought it off him through you know with micro um, micro um, 
coins, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's like a whole new area that's opened up, and uh, that could was never possible years ago. Right, right. and I think the blockchain will actually allow uh, artists and musicians to to kind of be that hybrid business person and artist if they choose to, to yeah. be that. I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, administrators and in intermediaries who feel like they could be threatened by, um, you know, the implementation of blockchain, but actually it increases their value proposition. So if you have the artist who just wants to focus on music, yeah. that uh, administrator can come along and say, hey, let me handle the business side for you. You know, we'll do all the micro payments for you. We'll handle all the blockchain. Yeah. We'll do all that administrative work for you. We just want you to get out there, write the music, perform the music, and, and focus on your craft. And then the blockchain's making it much more transparent, so they're less easily to be um, hoodwinked or robbed or, or um, you know, as what's happened over the years, I guess. Exactly, and, and once again, that allows the artist to have the choice of, okay, well, hey, I have the tools in front of me to make sure I see where, you know, my music is being used or my art or my works are being used. Um, I can go to a public blockchain, you know, just like checking my mail, I can check the blockchain and, and see how this is all being utilized. Or, you know, I could just have someone do it for me. Yeah. So. Fantastic. Well, I'm really excited. Um, I'm... I have very creative children and have been creative in my own right, more with human dynamics. Okay. Than <laughs> so I, I think that it's wonderful that um, creatives will be supported um, through all these changes that are coming, and um, I think it's just great. Yeah, well, thanks for, you know, having us here and allowing us to discuss this a little bit more, and, you know, hopefully we can get the word out and get people thinking about blockchains and music and how they can all come together. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kamal.